This is NTD Evening News. Live from our NTD Global Headquarters in New York City, here is Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. President Biden tonight holding his first solo news conference in eight months. His campaign seeking to reassure Americans that the president will stay in and win the 2024 race. NTD's White House correspondent Iris Tao has more on what's at stake. Ahead of a high-stakes press conference tonight, President Biden today at the NATO summit met with the Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky as he announced a new $200 million package of weapons for Ukraine. You've imposed significant cost on Russia, and, uh, and you made it clear Russia will not prevail in Ukraine, will not prevail in Ukraine. Ukraine will prevail. And I want you to know we're going to be with you every step of the way. And now all eyes are on President Biden's first solo press conference in over eight months. That's happening tonight at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And we do expect President Biden to face questions on both domestic and foreign topics, including his re-election bid and the challenges surrounding his campaign. Today, officials with the administration and the Biden campaign met with some Democratic senators. And some senators after the meeting said they are still firmly standing with President Biden, while some others say they want the Biden campaign to quell more concerns. Watch. Some of my concerns are laid. Some others have been deepened. I need more of the kind of analytics that show the path to success. Tonight will be important. Meanwhile, a White House advisor says he's not aware of any world leaders expressing concerns to Biden about the political situation in the U.S. And a new British prime minister said today that Biden was in, quote, really good form when they met on Wednesday. And we'll hear more directly from the president in just a few moments as he confronts more questions about his path forward. Reporting from the White House, Iris Tao, NTD News. The summit concludes as pressure in Europe is building up. NATO has plans to increase military capabilities overseas. Russia is accusing the alliance of escalating tensions and aiming for confrontation. NTD's international correspondent Arian Pazdar has the story. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken met with G7 foreign ministers at the sidelines of the NATO summit on Thursday. Not only celebrating 75 years of the alliance, but in particular putting the alliance in strong shape for the next 75 years. Blinken praised how the G7 works together on issues like Russia and conflicts in the Middle East. G7 strongly complements the work that's being done here at NATO. This comes as three G7 members, France, Germany and Italy, together with Poland, agreed to develop long-range missiles. That's just one day after NATO announced that the U.S. will deploy long-range missiles in Germany. I believe we've taken some bold steps in the last few days and weeks. We will take more bold steps in the days and weeks to come. The U.S. says the deployment of the weapons is an effort to demonstrate its commitment to NATO and European defense. At the summit on Thursday, Germany's chancellor commented on the decision. Which I think is a very good decision and it fits into all the decisions we already took. Russia, meanwhile, says they don't approve of NATO's plan. This is aimed against us, of course. We must be aware of this. The aggressive course of the United States and NATO is not changing. But we cannot be intimidated. We'll find a response. The Kremlin claimed NATO's goal is to maintain confrontation in the area, saying tensions in Europe are escalating as a result. Arian Pastar, NTD News. Israel has released the findings of its first investigation into what went wrong on October 7th. This comes as Israel blames the United Nations for humanitarian aid not getting into the Gaza Strip. NTD's Jason Perry has the Middle East update and a warning. This report contains footage that some viewers may find disturbing. In a video released on Thursday, residents in the Gaza Strip were gathered around watching a soccer game earlier this week when an explosion was heard nearby and people began running. The person holding the camera ran to the impacted area where several dead bodies lay on the ground, including children. The Hamas-run health ministry said at least 29 people were killed in the strike. The Israel Defense Forces, or the IDF, said they had used precise munition to strike a terrorist who had participated in the October 7th attacks. And the IDF said they are reviewing reports that civilians were harmed in the incident. 
Israeli government spokesperson David Mincer said this on Wednesday. We want to get civilians out of harm's way. We have no interest in harming civilians in Gaza City or anywhere else. We're trying to get to, to the terrorists, where the terrorists uh, attack from or where they have uh, set up base. Meanwhile, the head of Israel's Civilian Department on Humanitarian Efforts said the holdup on getting aid into the Gaza Strip is because the United Nations is not doing their job to distribute it. We uh, uh, conducted humanitarian road and we deconflicted it. We suggested them to use different routes. We suggested them to put their warehouses in different locations. All of this, and still they're not coming to pick it up and distribute it. The United Nations said they're doing what they can and that the aid trucks are being looted or attacked by criminal elements when they try to distribute the aid in the Gaza Strip. Also on Thursday, the IDF released the findings on the first investigation into what went wrong during the October 7th attacks. The report indicated that the attack started in one of the Israeli communities at 6.45 a.m and Israel didn't begin restoring operational control of the community until 10 p.m. The report said the simultaneous infiltration of thousands of terrorists through multiple locations was the main factor that prevented security forces from arriving sooner. However, the Jerusalem Post cited a report in Khan News, which said the Israel Defense Forces knew about the plans for the attack prior to October 7th. And the Times of Israel cited reports in Hebrew media, which also said the IDF knew about plans for the attack prior to October 7th, but thought it was empty boasting by Hamas. Jason Perry, NTD News. Today, thousands of spiritual believers gather in Washington, D.C. to call for an end to the Chinese Communist Party's persecution against the spiritual practice of Falun Gong, also known as Falun Dafa. This year marks the 25th anniversary. NTD's Sam Wang has more. It's been nearly 25 years since the Chinese Communist Party launched its nationwide persecution against Falun Gong. And here in the nation's capital, thousands of practitioners from all over the world are rallying to call for an end to this ongoing repression. Holding banners and wearing bright yellow t-shirts, Falun Gong practitioners remain undeterred by the sweltering heat wave in Washington, D.C. Along Pennsylvania Avenue, thousands march down the street, stretching banners that write, the world needs truthfulness, compassion, forbearance. My husband was killed. Simply, he went to Beijing to hand a letter. On the letter said, Falun Gong is good. My childhood wasn't exactly easy because my parents have been multiple, um, multiple times arrested due to their efforts to tell people the truth about the persecution. Falun Gong, also known as Falun Dafa, is a traditional Chinese spiritual practice based on the core teachings of truthfulness, compassion, and forbearance. Since its public introduction in 1992, Falun Gong's popularity surged, with an estimated 70 to 100 million people practicing in China. But things changed on July 20th, 1999. Practitioners found themselves the target of a nationwide persecution campaign. The Chinese Communist Party mobilized its entire state apparatus to target the millions of people who they saw as a threat to its authoritarian control. Look back 25 years ago when the horrific persecution of the Falun Gong started. That is really what revealed the nature of the regime. Uh, Falun Gong has been the canary in the coal mine. Uh, the, how they've been persecuted is a signal of future persecution. Millions of Falun Gong practitioners in China have been detained, tortured, and even killed for practicing their faith. State Department reports suggest an untold number of them were murdered on demand to supply the regime's organ transplant market. It is the most egregious and, and disgusting violation of a human and their dignity and their values to commit this systematic organ harvesting that is well documented. Congress has, has agreed and recognized uh, in a bipartisan way that this is happening and that we stand against it. Despite the CCP's efforts to stifle the spiritual discipline, Falun Gong is now flourishing globally with people from all walks of life practicing it in over a hundred countries. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Sam Wang, NTD News. Dozens of severe weather-related deaths reported nationwide. This as the U.S. continues to reel from the aftermath of Hurricane Barrel and a lingering heat wave. NTD's Fiona G has the numbers. After killing at least one person in Louisiana and six in Texas, the remnants of Hurricane Barrel moved on to Vermont. 
The storm washed away an apartment building, plowed through bridges, and killed at least one additional person. The remnants of the record-breaking hurricane are now headed for the northeast of the U.S. Officials are warning of heavy rainfall, potential flash floods, and even possible tornadoes in parts of New York and New England. Three days after Beryl made landfall in Texas, around one million people in Houston are still without power. This has left residents of the nation's fourth largest city with no electricity to face not only the destruction wreaked by the hurricane, but also sweltering heat and humidity. The summer of 2023 was the hottest in human history, and there's a possibility that 2024 could be worse. Nationwide, there have already been 38 confirmed deaths related to excessive heat. 28 of those came in just the past week. Victims ranged from an 87-year-old man in Oregon to a four-month-old baby girl in Arizona. Authorities say more heat-related deaths are to come. Across the U.S., over 135 million people are under heat alerts, many of which are expected to last until at least this weekend. Fiona G, NTD News. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Joining us now to break down the latest developments at the NATO summit are two guests. Robert Spaulding is a retired U.S. Air Force Brigadier General and former Senior Director for Strategic Planning at the White House National Security Council. Mary Beth Long is the former Chair of NATO's High Level Group and former U.S. Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security. Thank you both so much for joining us. Good to see you again. Now, General, I want to start with you. The NATO summit has concluded and a large focus is on China as a, quote, decisive enabler of Russia's war in Ukraine. First, what do you make of that statement and what are your overall thoughts on the NATO summit? Well, unfortunately, it's feckless because unless you're going to put uh, stress on China via sanctions or some other methodology, they're going to continue to supply Russia. And, uh, you know, we have seen no uh, indication that they're willing to slow down that support, e even in light of the, um, this, this type of language. Hmm. And Mary Beth, NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg said China can't enable the largest conflict in Europe in recent history without this negatively impacting their interest and reputation. What is your take on this? How should NATO deal with the China threat? Well, I think the Brigadier General has it right. Uh, this is the second or third time that uh, leadership in NATO have called out China and it be not only the most critical enabler, but uh, even the declaration goes on to say a threat to the Europeans. Um, without follow-up action, however, either from NATO itself or its membership, I think that the interpretation that she may get is that this is a bit of a paper tagger. Hmm. And General Beijing has fired back at that today, accusing NATO of having what it calls a Cold War mentality. Now, we are currently seeing China and Belarus holding a joint drill just miles from Poland. But that aside, what can we expect from China? I think they're going to do more of the same. They've, uh, you know, not only are supporting Russia in Europe, you know, they're aggressive in Asia, they're supporting Iran and who's supporting Hamas in the Middle East. So, you know, much like so the Soviet Union was creating challenges for the free world in proxy states around, has basically taken over that mantle in, in what is, you know, the second Cold War. Hmm. And Mary Beth, what about Russia? How might Russia respond to all of this? Well, I think Russia is looking at this with, with perhaps a bit of bemusement, if not amusement. Look, at the same time China is exercising with Belarus, it's parked one of its largest ships uh, just right off the coast of the Philippines. Russia, literally on the second day of the NATO meeting, uh, possibly intentionally uh, missile attacked a hospital that had children in it in Kyiv and didn't even bother to pretend it was a mistake. I think at this point, uh, Putin is going to do a wait and see and um, he'll probably not get much of a response, and he will force, I think, additional conflict and additional confrontations. General, speaking of Russia, during the summit, NATO members said Ukraine's path to the alliance is irreversible, but there is no specific timeline set, and President Biden has said Ukraine can't join until the war ends. How do you view the expansion of NATO to include Ukraine? I think it's, uh, you know, there's, it's going nowhere fast. 
Uh, I think, you know, what we should be trying to pursue with regard to Ukraine is a ceasefire, something akin to what we had uh, between South Korea and North Korea uh, during the Korean War. And I think the, the issue of whether or not Ukraine joins NATO, uh, you know, it's going to follow peace, but peace is not going to come anytime soon. So, you know, we're, we're going to be looking at this uh, issue, this stalemate, if you will, for a long, long time to come. Mary Beth, some analysts say it's not a good idea to promise Ukraine membership at all, even after the war is over. That's because it could incentivize Russia to continue the war. And once Ukraine does gain membership, NATO could be pulled into a war if Russia attacks Ukraine in the future. What do you make of that argument? No, I don't accept that argument. Look, uh, years ago in 2008, I was in the room when a number of nations, uh, Ukraine and Georgia included, ask for NATO membership and not promising at this stage NATO membership actually, I think, casts some doubt on whether any country has the ability to declare what organizations it wants to be part of and whether or not those organizations can accept it. Uh, we also have to understand that we can take Putin at his word. This isn't about Ukraine. This is about Russia reattaining some of the republics that it got rid of or that left it after the demise of the Soviet empire. I think a much more forceful response um, in, in this particular case, but I agree with the general, status quo ante and a continued war of attrition is not going to serve anyone's purposes other than Putin's. General, given the tensions we are seeing here, the war in the Middle East and tensions rising in Asia, what can the U.S. and allies do in terms of deterrence? Well, I think, you know, when you look at the, our international institutions today, by and large, they are supporting China and Russia in, in this conflict uh, in Europe. And, you know, what the United States has to do is get its mojo back. And really, in order to do that, I think it really needs to focus on building a strong coalition that's, that's more economically intertwined and that is isolationist when it comes to dealing with China and Russia. You know, if we continue to be aligned economically with China, we're going to funnel assets and resources into China and allow them to support Russia, Iran, and North Korea. So creating a strong coalition along the lines of the economic and military coalition that we had during the first Cold War is the beginning of beginning to strip away the global south from China's orbit. Hmm. And Mary Beth, you've said before that when it comes to foreign affairs, perception is reality. Now, polls have shown that in recent years, especially after the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, the U.S. power projection is starting to recede globally. Given that, how can the U.S. return to that stature? What are the necessary steps for that? Well, I think um, I, I was very surprised to hear a national leader of another country literally say uh, during the NATO conference that after what they saw the U.S. do in Afghanistan, it is clear that uh, the U.S. is in decline and that its power of projection and its power to influence is decline and declining. Look, I agree. We have got to get serious about our defense. We've got to get serious about our relationships. We have uh, fiddled around with half measures when it comes to Russia and sanctions. We have gone back and forth several times on Iran on sanctions regarding their nuclear program. We just aren't taken seriously. And we need a president and we need a nation that is taken very seriously, not only economically and security, but in the other domains we, we are being challenged, like space and cyber. In general, what about you? What do you see as the necessary steps the U.S. must take here? I absolutely agree. Again, it's really about um, changing the perception and changing the narrative. You know, we had during the first Cold War something called the U.S. Information Agency, and we were much stronger with regard to public diplomacy. And I think now there's new tools, tools like TikTok. And I think we do a very poor job of countering what is coming out of China and Russia and other um, bad actors. And so you know, we invented these technologies, so we ought to have a better grasp on how to muster um, global awareness and, and global support for our interests and our collective interests. And, and what I'm talking about here is the free world. General Robert Spaulding, Mary Beth Long, thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you.
Tensions in the South China Sea rising exponentially throughout the past year, mainly because of the relationship between China and the Philippines. But how did the long-running conflict begin? The other day, I spoke with retired Colonel Grant Newsham about the details. He's a senior fellow at the Center for Security Policy. Actually, give us a sense of when this conflict between the Philippines and China around the Scarborough Shoal started. Mm -hmm. When did this all begin? Sure, actually, and that's important to actually consider some recent history here. Uh, in 2012, the Chinese moved in on a place called Scarborough Shoals. It's like a reef in the in Philippine territory. And the Filipinos sent out some Coast Guard ships, and the, they had a standoff. The Americans uh, brokered a deal where both sides agreed to pull back. And what happened, of course, is the Filipinos pulled back. The Chinese did not, and they have stayed at Scarborough Shoals ever since. They effectively control Scarborough Shoals, which is Philippine territory. That was 2012. In a few years later, the Americans encouraged the Filipinos to bring a, a lawsuit to the Permanent Court of Arbitration, an international body. And in 2016, that uh, decision was made and was overwhelmingly in the Philippines' favor, demolished the Chinese claims and arguments that they they owned parts of what are Philippine territory and other things the Chinese were doing in the South China Sea. The ruling came out and it vindicated the Filipinos basically and just savaged the Chinese. The Chinese said to scrap a piece of scrap paper, we don't believe it, we're not going to follow it. The Americans did nothing to help the Filipinos enforce uh, this uh, ruler. In fact, the Americans said, uh, purposely said nothing so that they wouldn't uh, embarrass the Chinese, thinking the Chinese would appreciate the gesture. So that's two strikes when it comes to the Americans and the Filipinos. Now, uh, about a year ago, the Chinese really started pressuring uh, the Filipinos at Second Thomas Shoal. It's another reef within Philippine territory. There's a grounded Philippine ship there that has Marines and sailors on it, and that allows the Filipinos to demonstrate their control of that territory. The Chinese have just poured in ships and uh, really have started to play rough. So the Filipinos can't get to that, that, that ship and they need somebody to go with them. And that somebody has to be the Americans. And the Americans have not stepped in here. So we're getting pretty close to strike three as far as the Filipinos see it. See it. And that will leave pro-American Filipinos hanging and with their domestic opposition saying, look, what did the Americans do for you? Nothing. And all you've done is worsen relations with the Chinese. Uh, so our inaction is really having serious effects. And as I said, not just the Philippines, uh, but elsewhere in the region. Our friends and other countries are watching to see what we do. And our enemies are watching the same thing. A U.S. Coast Guard vessel encountered Chinese military ships within U.S. exclusive economic zone waters. The zone is considered international water. The U.S. exclusive economic zone spans 200 nautical miles from the U.S. coast. The vessel spotted three Chinese military ships off Alaska's Aleutian Islands. A Coast Guard helicopter spotted another Chinese vessel. The Coast Guard said yesterday the ships operated according to international standards. The U.S. responded with its own presence to ensure no disruptions to U.S. sea interests. Chinese naval ships have been spotted near Alaska before. In 2022, the Coast Guard found Chinese guided missile cruisers off Alaska. And in 2021, it encountered another set of Chinese ships in the area. In defeat for House Republicans today as they fail to pass their funding bill for the legislative branch, our Washington correspondent Luis Martinez joins us live with more on this story. Four Republicans voted with Democrats to defeat a resolution that would have held Attorney General Merritt Garland in inherent contempt of Congress. Congresswoman Ana Paulina Luna, the Republican from Florida, introduced the resolution against Garland for failing to provide the audio recordings of the interviews in between President Joe Biden and Special Counsel Robert Hur as part of the DOJ's investigation into President Biden's handling of classified materials. According to Congresswoman Luna, the resolution failed because some congressmen were absent in today's vote due to some family emergencies. Just so you guys know, just because it went down the first time doesn't mean it can't actually pass second time. We do believe that we have the votes. And as you guys are seeing, I think 
as according to the floor debates last night, the Democrats aren't too keen in, in defending Biden. So, House Republicans also failed to pass the fiscal year 2025 legislative branch appropriation bill. Ten Republicans voted with Democrats to defeat this bill. Among them, a Tennessee Republican Tim Burchett, who opposed the 5.6 government spending increase compared to fiscal year 2024. I wanted to ask you about the uh, inherent contempt resolution against uh, Merrick Garland. It it's disappointing. We had four Republicans that 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 didn't vote with us on that. Um, but we've had a lot. We have a lot of people out. Luna's going to bring it back. And we'll have the votes. The legislative brand appropriation bills also failed. Today yeah, was not a. is a 5.6 percent increase, and um, and we're people expect better out of us. House Republicans have passed the six appropriations bills thus far this summer, all of them along party lines, and none of them with the support of Democrats, and none of them will likely be picked up by the Senate. Switching to government funding, the legislative branch appropriation bill just failed. Uh, how do Democrats see this process playing along? Are they waiting for a continued resolution at the end of the term? Well, you know, obviously everyone's focused on November 5th, so uh, a CR will get us to beyond uh, September 30th, and and we'll move on if it gets to that point. Congress has until September 30th to reach an agreement on government funding for fiscal year 2025. If an agreement is not reached, government would face a shutdown. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. The Internal Revenue Service is cracking down on wealthy tax cheats. Last fall, the IRS launched an initiative to collect from millionaires who have not paid the taxes they owe. The agency identified about 1,600 taxpayers with more than $1 million in income who have more than $250,000 in tax debt. To date, more than $1 billion has been recovered from those individuals. The effort is still ongoing. The IRS ramped up its enforcement efforts with the money it received from the Inflation Reduction Act Congress passed nearly two years ago. Welcome back. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, plenty to discuss today, but let's start in soccer, where the U.S. national team has parted ways with head coach Greg Berhalter. Was this move expected? Yeah, I mean, I would have I would have been surprised if they didn't. You know, they had a very disappointing Copa America showing. They failed to get out of the group stage. Most observers thought they had a very favorable group, but the U.S. favored to beat both Panama and Bolivia, and that would have been enough to advance. They beat Bolivia, not Panama. I mean, that got that match got to a rough start with a red card in like the 18th minute. So they were pretty much down a man for the rest of the match. Then in their loss to Uruguay, admittedly, you know, there were some disputed calls for sure that didn't help them. But you could say these are things that a better come, a better team would have overcome. It just didn't happen. I think this is also made fact worse by the fact that it happened right here in the United States. Not just everybody saw it, but there's plenty of truth to the home field advantage that for whatever, whatever reason just did not equate to any more wins for them. Now who they'll replace him with is a mystery. The name Jurgen Klopp has, be, has come up recently. I mean that seems like a long shot. Basically whoever it is has two years to get their money for the World Cup, which is going to be played right here. Well, shifting gears to the NBA, the AP is reporting that the league is nearing a major media agreement with three different broadcast partners. Now, if approved, what would be the ramifications of this deal? You know, there's a number of them. For one thing, NBC would be back as one of their main broadcast partners. Now, NBC was M the NBA's main partner from 1990 to 2002. That was the Michael Jordan dynasty years. Jordan was a huge draw. In fact, those, those NBA finals in 97, 98 between the Bulls and jazz those are still the highest rated of all time and everybody loved their theme music nba on nbc around ball rock that'll reportedly be back as well meanwhile now back to this deal abc espn would still have the top package so they would still be having the uh, nba finals something that they've had since 2003 also amazon prime which recently jumped into the sports world they would have a package here but TNT Sports would be out. Now, they've had games since 1984 in the NBA, and they've got the very popular Inside the NBA show, which would unfortunately, it sounds like it would be going by the wayside too. Now, I, reportedly TNT Sports, though, would have a five-day window to match one of these deals, but that clock does not start until these are actually finalized, which they are not.
And Dave, the numbers being thrown around here are staggering. 11 years at a total of $76 billion. Now, if true, what does this mean for players' salaries? I mean, they would certainly go through the roof. And they're already high, high right now. I mean, the average NBA player makes $10 million a season. That 11 years, $76 billion figure comes to $7 billion a season nearly. That's nearest the, the NFL's number of $10 billion a season. In any case, should this new deal result in the league's salary cap rising by 10% per season, which is the maximum it can, you could have your first $100 million player per season before this new deal is done and it expires in 2036. Right now, the highest average annual salary, Jason Tatum of Boston at $62 million a season. So it's already getting up there right now. Moving to baseball news, Pittsburgh Pirates rookie sensation Paul Skeens was on pace to throw a no-hitter today but was removed after the seventh inning. Was there a reason given? You know, I still haven't seen a reason, but he was at 99 pitches already. That's plenty, especially for young pitchers who's this talented. Teams are always going to be extra cautious with a talented pitcher like this. Now, this is actually the second time this year he's been removed from the start without allowing a hit, and he's only made 11 career starts, so this guy looks like the real deal. Now, maybe if he had a perfect game going, I can see them leaving him in. I mean, those are so much more rare. In any case, he only walked out one, struck out 11, and as you said, no hits. Now, Skeens was the first year in last year's, the first pick in last year's draft out of LSU. In fact, he started the year in the minor leagues, dominating there, and now he's already dominating the major leagues. He's already been named an all-star. This is about as good of a career as you, a good of a start to a career as you can have in the major leagues. Well, Dave, as always, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, Tiff. With the Paris Olympics on their way, one key focus for athletes is their diet. A sports nutrition expert explains how diet plays a crucial role in pushing athlete performance to peak levels. Olympic athletes train hard and are always looking for something that gives them an edge over competitors. Their diet plays a crucial role in determining their success. Yeah, so Olympic athletes, when it comes to nutrition, these are the elite of the elite athletes. And so nutrition really can set them apart. When you talk about getting a second different or an inch different, nutrition can be that separator. A wide variety of factors must be taken into account in a top-notch nutrition plan for each athlete and they need to make sure that they're meeting calorie requirements, macronutrient requirements, that they're recovering and taking full advantage of what nutrition can offer them. Hydration plays a crucial role in peak athletic performance. There's no one-size-fits-all approach. Sports nutritionists create individual hydration plans for each Olympian based on their own personal needs. Of course, everyone needs to stay hydrated in general, a baseline level of hydration. But when it comes to how much does an athlete need, it's going to depend on their body size, their temperature and humidity that they're training in, uh, their clothes that they're wearing in the environment. I mean, there's so many factors and just their propensity to sweat. Are they a heavy sweater? Are they not a heavy sweater? So in terms of staying hydrated for an Olympic level athlete, it's going to be really personalized and not just how much fluid they need, but also how much sodium do they need. The intensity and duration of Olympic athletes' workouts require specific calorie intake needs. So calorie needs for an Olympic level athlete are going to depend on a number of different things as well. Body size is going to factor in. A bigger body is going to need more calories than a smaller body. The sport is hugely impactful in how much training they're doing. But I would tell you from just a general guesstimate, on the low end, we're talking probably at least 3,000 or more calories. That would be really a pretty low recommendation. All the way up to six, seven, eight thousand 8,000 calories and maybe even more. The U.S. Olympic team has their own sports dietitian for the upcoming games, which begin on July 26th. Today is 7-11, and NTD's David Lamb hears from people on how they are staying cool amid the heat and on their lunch breaks. One way to cool down your body during the summer heat is to get ice-cold drinks. Now, 7-Eleven is giving away free Slurpees for their 97th birthday, which falls on, which you might have guessed, July 11th. Let's find out how people are trying to stay cool. I got cherry and Coke. Yeah, I went with cherry. Just kept it classic, original flavor. I got all the flavors. All of them? Yeah. How many? Um, five. Five flavors? Okay. Actually, how... actually six. Six? How does it taste? Good. I got three. Well, I got a couple of cool waters and uh, a jug full of root beer with ice. What's your go-to, Serpy? Me? Yeah. Um, I really like the blue one. The blue one? Yeah. 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 The blueberry's cool. Can't go wrong with that one. Other ways to stay cool include... 
either I go ice skate or go to the pool. I either go to my buddies, hop in the pool, or just chill nice at my place. Okay. Yeah, that's the go-tos. I'm usually at work during the heat hours, but uh, I go home, take a shower, relax. You know, I'll water in the backyard, water in the front yard. And what are some family traditions as kids? Growing up, usually just turning on the AC. Yeah, we just go to the park, probably sometimes barbecue, even though it's hot. But at least we're outside, like cooking some food, enjoying something with the heat. Sleep all day. Um, actually, I just play fun game. Or sometimes play fun game. What does your mom do for you? Mm, sometimes she does like ice cream. Salvador, we eat fruits and mango. Get wet in the backyard, water balloon fights. We'll be complaining it's hot, but in the winter we're complaining that it's cold, you know? <laughs> it, it's life, man. Yeah. We gotta deal with the elements no matter what. As we head into the weekend, elements in western U.S. forecasted to continue with high temperatures and widespread heat warnings. The yellow indicating near 90 degrees Fahrenheit across the map, forecasting hazardous heat across a large portion of central and eastern U.S. heading into next week. NOAA says to stay hydrated, decrease time out of the sun, and to check in on others. David Lamb, NTD News. And that's all for today's news. The president hasn't started speaking yet, but you can watch his speech at NTD.com or download our NTD app. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Tiffany Meyer. Good night.